I was actually shaped by two ecclesial traditions, uh, the Mennonites and the Nazarenes. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Nazarenes. Two very radically different traditions, um, very much so now. But um, as my family originated out of Arkansas, the one thing they had in common is this sort of just old school piety where they both kind of looked the same because of, you know, for all the good and bad of, of Mennonites, it, it, it's still rooted in a very sort of patriarchal tradition. And uh, um, so dress code and things like that. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that. Even my pants have buttons on them today, you know, because <laughs> the whole button zipper debate is still ongoing in a few circles. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, um, speaking of which, please, please don't, if you know any Mennonites, don't tell them that I used to teach kickboxing classes. Um, that doesn't always go over too well. But it was only for exercise, only for exercise. Um, but they actually resembled one another. And so when, when my family in Arkansas, um, some of the Mennonites, they moved to North Carolina, and they, they couldn't find many Mennonite um, communities. And they found a Nazarene community that looked like the Mennonites. So they're like, well, they, they, they must love Jesus too, because <laughs> look at the pants they're wearing. And they all like black shirts or plaid shirts. And, uh, but they couldn't be two more difficult, uh, different traditions uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but the one thing that they had in common is, is they loved to, uh, uh, they loved to not, you know, sort of inundate you with, with scripture. And so if nothing else, I grew up very much uh, loving and not loving the Bible because we were at church, you know, three times a week and uh, um, um, learning it. And it's funny, I was actually, Telling when this past week that at Virginia Wesleyan, which is a predominantly Christian school, it's very rare that I even have a student who even knows about the story of Noah. Though they will because there's a Russell Crowe film coming out. <laughs> um, so I don't know who Noah's going to be punching in this film, but I'm sure Russell Crowe will find a way. Um, and, and so it's really interesting. When, and then I'm there and I'm like, where's all my fundamentalists? <laughs> you know, <laughs> where's all the kids that sort of know these stories? So I just sort of grew up, and now I'm just, to quote Flannery O'Connor, quite haunted by those traditions because they, they kind of won't let you go. Um, but that, those were very formative for, for good and potentially ill. Uh, um, uh, but I think those traditions gave me some interesting, if not odd, uh, views of how to look at both the church and the world that I'm not sure I, I may have without the quirkiness of the Mennonites. Um, uh, to put it hospitably, <laughs> very quirkiness. Um, but that's, that's a little bit about my, my sort of upbringing and, and my family and such and how I ended up kind of where I ended up, ecclesially speaking. Although I ended up graduating from a Nazarene university, then did my master's at a Methodist school and my PhD at a Methodist school. So I feel quite ecumenically diverse. Of course, all the Methodists that I was studying with, none of them liked the Methodist church. They all wanted to be Catholics. Um, (laughs) So I was getting this very pro-Catholic bent from the Protestants who uh, were just remaining Protestants because they liked Catholicism in theory. All of my professors, faculty, all loved it in theory, but none of them wanted to to attend the churches. They probably all went to the Episcopal church. (laughs) Well, that was it. It it was, and I don't mean this in a bad, it was the great compromise. You know, you can sort of have your Catholicism, you know, you could have your high liturgical, uh, um, but also, yeah, yeah. So So what, um, what is, tell us about a little bit about the, the Mennonite tradition of, of uh, nonviolence and peace. Where did that come from? How did that, uh, how did that emerge? And why is that important to you? Yeah, so in the, in the 16th century, um, and some of you may know the history of the Reformation, and Martin Luther pops up, and uh, uh, you have the Reformation. Well, there was another Reformation that occurred that's often referred to as the Radical Reformation. And it was a group of Christians sort of popping up o- over Europe. Um, who were more interested in challenging, of all things, you know, some of the basic stuff, infant baptisms, the believer's Baptist uh, tradition, uh, a number of political things about swearing oaths, you know, you don't swear oaths. Why don't you swear oaths? Because Jesus says not to, you know? It was like very sort of a simple thing. And um, one of the things that the the Anabaptists, when I say Anabaptists, I'm referring to what's become known as the Hutterites, the Mennonites, the Brethren, the Amish, uh, wanted to challenge was the church-state relationship uh, as it developed from the 4th century on through the 16th century. Uh, 
and uh, this whole fusion of church, state, and Christendom. And so this group of reformers, radical reformers in the 16th century sort of looked back to the early church, the first 300 years, and said, maybe there's something right in, in, that, in that century that we would like to somehow find, again, that we could sort of locate and practice. And if nothing else, what's well, interesting about these radical reformers is that they gave the Catholics and Protestants something to bond over in the 16th century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, as Hauerwas once said, the only thing that Catholics and Protestants could agree on in the 16th century is that it was a good thing to kill the Mennonites. <laughs> Um, it, it was true because the problem with, with the Mennonites and the Anabaptists is they were deemed politically subversive, um, primarily because they weren't interested in a, in a, in a church state or state church. Um, they didn't swear oaths, which uh, um, people just couldn't figure out why were they doing it, and they refused to take up the sword, um, uh, which as interesting as that is, the refusal to take up the sword just angered everyone, you know, why, why won't you, you know, um, kill? Uh, um, and so part of what this grew, and of course they also um, were not advocating for infant baptism, and part of those reasons were very political. It wasn't just a theological thing. It was just ever since approximately 386 AD, um, if you're born a Roman citizen, once it's the Christian empire, you had no option but to baptize. I mean, it was, uh, that was just a right, R-I-T-E. You, you had no option. You were born a Christian. And so a lot of the Anabaptists thought, well, that's kind of problematic. Um, and so they look back at the early church, and they see how interesting it, it is that in the first approximately 280 years of Christianity, three centuries of Christianity, there's not a single bishop, cleric, or priest who, who advocates for a justified use of violence. Um, and that tradition is so strong that even when you get to Ambrose and St. Augustine, who develops the first justification for war in Christianity, the presumption of peaceableness is so strong that even Augustine says, but this still doesn't allow for self-defense. We're only concerned about third-party innocence. And even then, it's very rare that a follower of Jesus can actually participate in violence. And they're like, well, what an interesting little group of Christians those first 300 years. You know, uh, um, they had so much in common with Jesus in the sense that, you know, Jesus promised persecution, promised that the world would hate them, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Jesus and the disciples uh, and his followers all faced uh, um, persecution and martyrdom. And then suddenly, the church is controlling the world. They thought, well, that's interesting. How did that happen? You know, how did, well, is Jesus finally triumphant, you know, uh, now that Jesus is a Roman? Um, and so those were kind of the issues they were trying to work out. Now we have the kind of culture that you can work out those issues with one another, and it's quite lovely. But in the 16th century, it was very dangerous. It was very dangerous, and martyrdom really comes back. Uh, um, unfortunately, martyrdom comes back at the hands of, of, of other Christians. And so that's why to this day, especially the Old Order Mennonites and the Amish, um, they still don't trust you. <laughs> because they never know when, when, you're gonna, when, when you may throw down on them. Uh, um, which is why they're fine, you know, uh, in, in, in Ohio and Indiana and Pennsylvania, just sort of doing their own thing. They'll, they'll leave you alone as long as you promise to leave them alone. Uh, um, but those are some of the sort of the historical roots that, that produced the Anabaptist church and the Mennonites. And it was really just an attempt to get back to the early church's understanding of, of politics and, and how you embody the world. And, and it's very interesting because what the Anabaptists think of, um, and I think this is so sort of crucial for how we think about politics in the church today, is that the Anabaptists don't think that the church has a politic. It doesn't think it has a politic or it adopts a politic. What's interesting is that they think the church is a politic. And that's a huge difference, right? Is a politic, doesn't have a politic, so it doesn't need to adopt a politic, it doesn't need to adopt liberal democracy or socialism or communism or philosophical accounts of anarchism or anything like that. For them, the gospel is a politic and it's an alternative politic to all other politics. And I think that's why sometimes they do look so strange um, because on some issues they, they look extremely conservative, on other issues they look extremely liberal. Uh, uh, but they're not interested in being left-wing or right-wing or anything like that. 
those weirdos are interesting in, in taking Sermon on the Mount literally. And that will make you kind of strange. <laughs> and it honestly sort of scared me. I never understood, you know, especially in our culture where, you know, uh, you, know you, you hear how Jesus just solves all your problems. And I didn't even know all the problems I had until I started reading Jesus. And, uh, you know, I, you read the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm like, I remember the first time as a teenager when I was reading, of course, I was, they were forcing me to memorize it as a five-year-old. Um, I say forcing loosely. Um, you don't have to, but, you know. Uh, uh, but I remember the first time as a teenager reading the Gospel of Matthew, and I just chucked it and said, no thanks! You know, because you know, if Jesus means what he says, that's some heavy stuff. You know, I, I, think, I'll, I think I'll pass. <laughs> um, uh, though, though the folks don't really sort of allow you to pass, which it's an inter- interesting tradition because the Mennonites, they want, uh, uh, because they believe in believer's baptism, they want you to sort of freely choose whether or not you're a Mennonite. But they will indoctrinate you the second you pop out of the womb. I mean, it is, you know, they are on you 24-7. But freely choose, by the way, to, to, baptize, to be baptized. We want you to make your own decision, um, but be at church three times a week. <laughs> so, what, Tripp, what happened to you in this process? You, oh. you, 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 know, you were, uh, where did, uh, where did um, you kind of come into the mix here and, and uh, in, in your own journey, in your own studies? I, I still find myself, is anyone familiar with the tradition of Rumspringa, by chance? Does anyone know what that is? Tell us, tell, tell us what Rumspringa is. Isn't that where you go out and experience the world and then you, you get to decide whether or not you want to remain a Amish person? Right, yeah. The Amish have this very interesting tradition because they're really concerned about you freely choosing to be Amish. So at age 16, the Amish say, all right, kids, go out and experience the world in all its grandeur. Um, it's often referred to as the Devil's Playground. There's actually a documentary called The Devil's Playground on that. Um, go out, do whatever it is that English people do, and then come back and decide whether or not you want to be Amish or English. And um, for the most part, it's really quite boring because the kids just go to the mall and go shopping. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whose fault that is, you know, because they're like, what does it mean to not be Amish? I think it just means to shop, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, wow, we're not giving them a very good witness, you know. Uh, um, and so I always joke around how I'm, I think where I am, I'm still on Rumspringa. Um, <laughs> I'm still running around. That's what the term means, to sort of run around. Uh, um, uh, and so that's honestly kind of where I'm sort of playing around with those, those kind of things and one foot in, one foot out kind of thing. Um, because what I love about the Mennonites is they have to always let you back in. You know, um, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> they have to bring me back in at any time. So, uh, um, yeah. What, um, tell us a little bit about you um, kind of going, going back to the, the whole understanding of um, nonviolence and shalom. Where do they find, where are the roots of that in scripture and, and, and tradition? How do you, how do you all... How do you conceive of it for yourself? You're a, um, you're in that tradition. You're a kickboxer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, um, I mean, historically, what they uh, historically had a lot of the Anabaptists see the tradition of nonviolence is they look at the entire movement of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and they see it. You know the initial ontological piece and then a sense of trying to gravitate back toward the peace, especially through the prophets, where the prophets are talking about the Messiah and they'll war no more. Uh, um, they'll turn their uh, weapons and the tools for gardening and these kind of things. And what's so interesting maybe, I guess, about the Anabaptists is that they actually think that when that Messiah comes, or did come, Jesus, that they should take those things quite literally. It wasn't just sort of a metaphor. Um, and so uh, that whole tradition, although there's lots of violence in the Old Testament for sure, but they argued that the entire tradition of the Hebrew Bible is leading toward shalom, toward peace, and that now that the Messiah has come, it is incumbent upon Christians to embody that peace, to give a witness to it. Otherwise, how would the world know if there's not a body of people actually living uh, um, that messianic kind of lifestyle? Um, 
Lifestyle's a weird word. Um, and so they look at Jesus and they say, you know, there are things where it's, it's really complicated. You know, Jesus liked to talk in, in parables. And there are times when you're like, I wish you would just, you know, do I pay taxes or not? I'm still trying to figure that one out, you know. <laughs> uh, what, what really it does belong to Caesar? Um, uh, but then there are other times when he's just so magnificently simple, you know. Doesn't even use multisyllabic words, you know. Uh, um, and so you get to the Sermon on the Mount, and, and, and he's telling you about loving your enemies. Uh, what, what does that look like? Uh, um, turning the other cheek. He takes the sword out of Peter's hand um, uh, and, and, and renounces Peter for his attempt to defend him. Um, bless, you know, pray for those who persecute you, et cetera, et cetera. And for them, it's just very simple. You know? It's very clear. To, you know, vengeance belongs to God. Uh, um, uh, it, it's a very simple sort of witness. And for that tradition, if someone is not embodying that witness, uh, um, uh, then they fear that the concern is, and this may sound triumphalistic, but the concern is that you're kind of leaving the world hanging in that regard. And that's kind of why the Amish and Old Order Mennonite groups organize the way they do. What I like about Mennonites and Amish is a couple of things. One, they're never going to come knocking on your door asking you if you know Jesus. I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> I, I'm all right with that. Um, and two, even though they sort of fall down on certain political issues as being conservative, they're never going to try to make laws that determine for other people what they can and cannot do. You know, what they think it means to embody Christianity is you create your own culture within a larger culture, and you simply live it. And that culture in and of itself should be attractive enough to bring other people in. If you find yourself having to talk, you know, and, 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 and constantly tell people, and to persuade people via words, then in those traditions you've failed. You should be able to do it simply by the way you live and nothing else. Well, that sounds all good in theory, but who wants to milk cows at five in the morning? And that's part of what it be, means to be Amish, because part of it is uh, the self-sufficiency of those cultures, because they want to be as independent as they possibly can and not be complicit in certain power structures, power structures that are complicit with violence. Uh, um, that they, they've also sort of created this entire way of life that goes with farming and, and, and things of that nature as well. Um, but a lot of it is just, let's just pretend, let's just imagine as a thought experiment that Jesus actually may have meant what he said and just see what happens and goes with it. And so they've been going with it for about 500 years, and depending on how you look at it, it, it may be an interesting, you know, experiment, so to speak. As Soren Kierkegaard once referred to Christianity as, as an experiment. Yes, ma'am. Um, that was an interesting point you made about determining if Jesus meant what he said. So in these cultures, when they're determining how they live, did they go by the words of Christ, or are you looking more broadly at the context of the gospel that they draw his words from? Because Jesus didn't say very much. Mm. So if you're going to build your culture around only the things that Jesus said, that's different than I'm going to take what the disciples say and also what the gospels say. Oh, right, right. Well, for them, uh, um, the New Testament, it's canonical. So it's not just the words of Jesus. It's also, now those are going to take precedence. If there's any issue, you know, if there's a disagreement between Peter and Paul, and it seems to be a conflict between Jesus and one of the others, you always go with those few words of Jesus. Um, but they will, you know, it's a canonical uh, tradition in the sense that, you know, Scripture, scripture is authoritative um, for them in that regard. Oh, no, it's very, much, it's very much Old Testament as well. And again, a, a lot of what they do in terms of dealing with issues of violence, you know, Joshua and the conquest and uh, um, all the stuff in the Old Testament, is they read it through the lens of the prophets, where the prophets are saying, this is, none of this is good, and we're trying to get to a point where this happens no more kind of situation, and that occurs when the Messiah comes. So their lens for reading much of that Old Testament is through the prophets, which is also through Jesus. Um, if that makes sense. I think so. So if there's a dispute about a way of living or a decision within the community, mm -hmm. how do they decide what they're going to do through Scripture? You argue. And, and that's one good thing uh, that Mennonites and groups do well. It's is, very rabbinic. It's very, yes. I mean, you argue it through. And it's funny, like, being in Mennonite circles, because if, if you're an outsider looking in, you're thinking, I don't think they really like one another. I mean, because <laughs> we will battle. You, you can't battle with your fist, so you have to be able to do it verbally, right? Uh, 
uh, uh, and we, but, but it's funny though, when that outsider steps in and says, I'd like to raise a point, then we all gather together and like, no, you know, we're still suspicious, <laughs> you know, we're going to team up on you. Um, but yeah, it, it's very sort of rabbinic as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Does everybody get to argue or do you have to own property or do you have a family? Or now, you know, it all depends. I mean, there are very sort of patriarchal ordered, old order Mennonite um, communities as well as Amish where I would definitely say they're not liberated in the sense that every voice is equal by any means. Um, so it all depends on which community. In each, I mean, each Mennonite community, old order, they're so, they can be very different. There are certain common themes between them, but in terms of those kind of things, um, some of them are very egalitarian. I mean, borderline just anarchistic. Uh, um, and others are, I mean, they're still, one of the Mennonite churches here still divides the men on one side and the women on the other. Um, so, yeah. I want to jump in with one question. Yeah, sorry. Um, and that is, you just used the word anarchistic, and uh, you talk about Christian anarchism. Yeah, reluctantly. <laughs> you not want to talk about it? I mean, no, we can. It's just whenever I do, all the anarchists are scratching their head going, what the heck is he talking about? And all the Christians are scratching their head going, what the heck is he talking about? So sometimes I just, I use anarchism in the sense of what it means to be freed from the powers that be. Yeah. Kind of, kind of an idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Which is interesting because in, in, the, in the Anglican tradition, which we haven't lived very well, uh, it real, the whole aspect of, of conversion through alternative community, community of prayer rooted in the liturgy in this particular situation, I mean, there's some, there's some similarities hmm. in that sense, that right. the formation uh, and morality and ethics are not, are not, uh, are not done by, um, it's, it, it's shaped within a person's conscience in a community of love and faith versus uh, a set of laws or a set of principles. Right. Which and is very confusing to a lot of Episcopalians who come from other <laughs> traditions. Right, yeah. Yeah. Did, you did have a question? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, 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 we've kind of moved past it. My question was, uh, as it's rabbinical and as they talk things out, have they developed what the, in the Jewish tradition would be called a midrash? Do you have? I, I, I mean. Or did they make it up, do they? It, it's more it's more spontaneous uh -huh. in that and part of that is the notion it's almost kind of related to the Quakers the, the Holy Spirit may in, influence you right. to read at this particular time so I don't know if you we sort of develop commentary in the sense that then that in and of itself because but it is a tradition that refers back to tradition so a lot of at least academic um, groups of 20th century Anabaptists when they're talking about these things <coughs> We go back and talk about how the 18th century Anabaptists talked about it, how the 16th century Anabaptists talked about it, how Aquinas, how Augustine, how Tertullian, uh, Cyprian, and all these folks talked about it as well. So in that sense, I think it's, it can be steeped in tradition. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the, the uh, New Order Mennonites, I think they've been far more influenced by liberal Protestants in the sense that um, uh, they don't have quite the love for tradition that they once had. You know, we're all individuals and we can all make up our own minds at any given time kind of thing. So they don't converse with the tradition quite as much as, as some of the older ones do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you resolve the argument after everybody's argument? Uh, consensus. I mean, and, and part of that is, you know, and maybe that's democratic, but uh, it's the idea that the community sort of makes the decision. So it's not like you have a town you go to and a, a what? Sorry. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what's telling about this in the 16th century, uh, when Anabaptist churches started popping up, um, because they were so critical of the hierarchy of the church, that was one of the things they were protesting, that the power of the hierarchy in the church. And so what would happen is in the 16th century, in order to decide who's going to be the minister you know, or the preacher of that community, they would draw lots to determine. Who, because they're still, even if you're saying there's, you're still not operating with any more power than anyone else, but you are going to be the representative speaker. It still sort of implicitly says this person is leading. And so they would draw lots. Now, the other reason they would draw lots is because when Catholics or Protestants were looking at people to kill, <laughs> they would go after the minister. So there's also the sense that, you know, because you, you knock out the head of the community and the rest will follow. So there's also Don't the sense the that, <laughs> right. <laughs> So there's also the sense that when that person draw, you know, drew the shorter straw, they're like, oh, man, you know, I've got, I've got to be the minister. <laughs> um, so in that sense, it's very communally determined um, in theory. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on 
uh, I read a chapter in your book on profit-centered capitalism. Wait, which which book did you just? Oh, okay, yeah. In your chapter on the Christian on the Catholic workers. Where do I don't know that we have time for that one. <laughs> um, I, I I think that if any socioeconomic order, whether it's capitalism, whether it's socialism, uh, whether it's bartering, ancient orders of gift exchange, need to be interpreted through the lens of, 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 of scripture and the church as opposed to uh, um, those things interpreting the church. And I think part of the problem with the church in the United States is, is the fact that obviously she has a dual identity. You know, Christians in America are Americans. And the question becomes, you know, um, does America narrate your sense of being a Christian or does Christianity narrate your sense of being an American? And I would see that by and large, uh, we've allowed other political ideologies, economic orders, to determine what Christianity looks like. And that's probably why it's so hard to take Jesus seriously when it comes to money. There are over 1,500 references uh, um, telling you what to do with your resources in the Bible. And almost all of them are saying to share it or to give it away. Historically speaking, in the church and even up through the Middle Ages, goods are only goods unless they're shared goods because they have a theology of creation by which no one can dictate ownership over something that God created and meant for all creation. Um, and it's very difficult to read those kind of things. Now, South American theologians tend to read those passages well, but that's because they're also poor, <laughs> you know? And, 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 so I would, I would distrust my own thoughts because I'm probably too rich to read Jesus well uh, when it comes to those things. Um, so I look toward groups like the Catholic Worker, uh, um, Dorothy Day, and uh, uh, Peter Moore, uh, the witness of the Berrigan brothers, Clarence Jordan, uh, um, uh, and how they read that and so that they can help me to read it well because I probably can't read it well. I'd live right down the road. So, <laughs> yes. Do you think that in a sense that the Mennonite view of religious liberty and the separation of church and state and the, the bifurcation between throne and altar has uh, won out, in a sense, within Christianity as time has gone on, that we've kind of got, gone past the, uh, the sense that the church and the state need to be unified. Right. I think historically it's interesting because a lot of people looked at the Anabaptists in the 16th century as being apolitical, and they still see them as apolitical. Um, yeah, if not for us, I mean, we're really forerunners in the separation of church and state, not just theoretically wise, but actually doing it. Um, and I think that's an incredible sort of thing that they accomplished, and it's very political in that regard, um, that's had that sort of influence. Uh, um, and it's very interesting to me, the sort of groups that want to gravitate back toward a merger between church and state, and what's fueling that, you know, what, what's fueling that, that desire. And I would probably say a lot of that has to do with the misinterpretation of what the church represents. The church is its own country. I mean, the one thing, the one thing that's so problematic about tying your church to a nation state is because then uh, you become sectarian, you become tribal. Uh, um, but the church is the church, I mean, the church Catholic is universal, so it transcends all borders, right? So why, why would the church as a country, as its own nation, ever tie itself to one particular nation state? Uh, um, and I think that's one of the interesting things that they sort of attempted to see uh, and, and embody that. And I think a lot of churches are some getting, some are getting beyond that and they take it for granted now. Um, uh, so it's a very political tradition, but only political in the sense that it has its own sort of politics that attempts to narrate other, other forms. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um. I recently went um, with the Baggerly, mm -hmm. the Catholic worker, to Knoxville, Tennessee, to um, stand with the people who were being sentenced for action to get a bridge missile production. And um, it was an incredible eye opener for me, not theologically so much as to realize that there are a lot of people who are totally, truly, 
sure, sure. And I, and I don't think this makes them apolitical. I think Anabaptists as a whole are, uh, are by and large a little reluctant to engage that way. Um, uh, what they want to do is to provide, and, and there are certainly flaws with this, they simply want to provide an alternative to the way of the world. So rather than protesting the world, rather than going out and saying this is where you're wrong, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to create our own, you know, Community. Now, there certainly are, especially within younger, um, more urban Mennonites uh, um, in groups that do participate in those actions because uh, um, you know, nuclear weapons, the scourge of the earth, you know. Um, but by and, large, they, by and large, they steer clear of such activism only in the sense that they fear. And Philip Berrigan talked about this. Philip Berrigan, in his autobiography, once said, I didn't realize how prideful I was as an activist because my act, and I love Philip Berrigan, by the way. Um, but Berrigan said, my activism came, became so much about me and what I was doing and what I was showing to the world. And I became self-righteous because everyone else is wrong and I'm right. And they're so fearful of those things. So they're not critical. They think it's good, but they're sometimes reluctant to jump on board with those kind of things. Um, and those are community debates. And sometimes as a community, they decide, do we want to protest this as a community? Do we want to go down to Fort Benning, Georgia, where there's an annual protest every single year? And you do end up with a lot of Mennonites down there with a lot of Catholics, you know, and a lot of Protestants as well. And they have that sort of protest. Um, and as long as those protests remain nonviolent, um, then there's not an issue. But sometimes they're a little more reluctant to jump on board with, with some of the lovely Catholic worker people that I want to push them on board with um, <laughs> sometimes, but yeah. And, and that's not an endorsement of the op opposite position. Um, they're just, they're worried about what it looks like, you know. Um, and, and the problem with some of the Berrigan Brothers activities is, you know, it was vandalism and things of that kind of nature. And they don't want to give that kind of look, even if it's for a good cause. There were local Mennonites standing with um, um, Steve Right down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's such a, it's such a peaceful sort of, you know, like you said, it's every first Tuesday of every month. You just go down there and hold your sign and you end up with probably some pretty interesting conversations with people. So they see it as an opportunity to engage in dialogue. You also get people that throw stuff at you. <laughs> you also get people that throw stuff at you. Um, um, yeah. Why does everyone want to kill all the pacifists? I don't get it. I want to, you, uh, while, while we're talking about that, killing the pacifists, yeah. uh, uh, martyrdom has been a thread uh, in, your, in your studies and your interest, and you did, a, you did a dissertation on that. Tell us a little bit about that, that, that side of things and, and the connection there with, with Christian martyrdom. Sure. And I'm, I'm actually quite reluctant to talk about that as well, because I'm always worried that one day God's going to make you Annie up. Um, <laughs> you know, you start singing their praises and then, you know, I don't even like, I'm afraid of a paper cut, um, much less what's up. But my, and a lot of it had to do again with my interest in, in physical forms of witness. And of course the word martyr simply means witness. And in the first century, that's all it meant. Actually in a legal sense, the word simply meant someone who could testify to an action in, in a court of law. The word just means witness. And in that sense, martyrdom is very much a Christian invention of the second century. Uh, based on one little cryptic passage in the book of Revelation, um, martyrdom doesn't mean blood witness until about the middle of the second century. When Christians decided that they wanted to give a different sort of title to those people who confessed to Jesus um, and may suffer but don't die, but do, do not die because of it, and those who actually die because of it. And that's where the category of martyrdom, uh, um, which now it's a hugely, you know, martyrdom means a lot of different things, but actually it's very much grammatically speaking, a, a sort of a, a Christian conception as we know it as a blood witness. And so I was very interested in those stories. And I guess if there was a, 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 another Bible to the Mennonite church, it's called the Martyr's Mirror or um, the bloody theater of the defenseless Christians and all their enemies from the first century to the 16th century. It's got this long, ridiculous subtitle. But The Martyr's Mirror is, I mean, it's huge. It's this massive book. And uh, if there was an alternative text, it's to read alongside scripture. It's that book, and it just details the martyrs from uh, um, St. Stephen, considered the first martyr, uh, 
uh, um, it talks about the disciples to Polycarp, Perpetua, uh, um, all the way up through the 16th century. Uh, um, and what's interesting about it, what I find interesting about it is, and this occurs in Catholic and Protestant martyrologies too, because in the 16th and 17th century, Catholics and Protestants started creating their own martyrology because whoever is in it is considered to be a true Christian in the sense that they give witness to who the church is. So you have these three you know, different groups all giving their own accounts of martyrdom and they're excluding one another. Because you know, a good Catholic can't, can't include a Protestant martyr especially if that Protestant was killed by the Catholics, <laughs> you, know? you know, what does that mean? And the Protestants are not including the Catholics, and the Anabaptists are like, we're not including any of you, uh, um, although they, they do up until about the 16th century. And what I find interesting is there's this lovely story about this, this guy named Leonard Kaiser, and the Mennonites love this story of, of this Anabaptist martyr, only to find out decades later that the guy wasn't an Anabaptist, he was a Lutheran. <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh, do it. But I, I love that because sometimes the church doesn't even know its own people, you know? And, 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 it's, and it's really interesting how that category became um, the highest form, the ultimate form of imitatio Christi, but also a way of naming the church. Uh, and a lot of it is martyrdom is the protest against the so-called invisible church, you know? The church is either visible or it doesn't exist in those traditions. Uh, um, and martyrdom is very visible. It's very visible. And, uh, and, and so I just became fascinated, um, dementedly so, because you can only read but so many stories of the martyrs before you're like, I'm kind of wrecked. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've got to stop. And, it, it, and what's terrifying, of course, is you read about all the torture instruments of, of, the, of the Romans in the first and second, third century, only to find out how clever Christians got at torture by the 16th century. I mean, the Romans would have been proud when they figured out the devices that we came up with in the 16th century <laughs> uh, um, to force other folks to recant from their heretical views. Um, but that's a whole other issue altogether. Uh, uh, um, but, you know, historically speaking, I, you know, for Catholics and Protestants, heresy is, is so dangerous because they see it as a plague. And, and, you know, are you willing to make certain people suffer in order to save other people? Uh, and the Anabaptists are like, how did we ever get there from Jesus? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a huge leap that happened. Um, yes, ma'am. Do, do you think Jesus, what did Jesus say about heresy, for instance? What did Jesus say about heresy? Yeah. I wouldn't think he'd care. <laughs> well, I mean... Paul is pretty, you know, Paul thinks that it, it matters, doctrine matters, that right teaching. And I think, I think Jesus was very much, I mean, I think that's what he was doing when, he, when we find him as a teenager arguing with other rabbis. Is obviously, I think he thinks something is at stake because he's arguing with them. And in that sense, I think Jesus was a very good Jew, right? I, I think putting him in his context, I think he thinks those things matter because my understanding of folks like Paul, as well as the early church and as well as the historical church, is that it's difficult to end up with right practices if you don't have right teaching, and vice versa. The practice precedes theory, and the theory precedes practice. Who knows which one comes first, you know? Because you're so heavily formed before you even hear the teachings by a tradition. Um, now, whether or not he would exclude on those things is a totally different matter. Although, you know, he does talk about sin and how to deal with someone who is a repetitive sinner, so to speak, and, how you, and that's how Mennonites and Amish deal you know, with, with folks in the community who decide to perpetually continue certain things that that community sees as, as sinful or, you know, a vice, um, which is where you get excommunication and the ban and the shun um, from Matthew. Oh, somebody tell me, what passage is that? Somebody just calls to mind something Gandhi said, and I'm oh. paraphrasing. Why is it that everybody, under, why, how is it that everybody but the Christians understands that Jesus is not violent? Right, yeah. Yeah, he says the only people in the world who do not see uh, Jesus and his teachings as nonviolent are Christians. <laughs> Gandhi was funny. Um, he, also took, he also took down the British. That's pretty impressive. You know, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty impressive. Yes, sir. How do you see the, the church evolving there in terms of a capitalistic world? And what does a group like us that's a church, who are probably most of us at least in the top 50% of economic ability, Deal with those who are in the bottom ten percent. Wow, 
No, wait, so you're asking how I see the church evolving, or are you asking how... How would you like maybe to see it evolve to do that? Let me ask you a different way. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I, I would be very leery of any suggestions I would give, so maybe I would just point you to Acts 2, verses 44 through 47, where it's referring to the early church sharing all, you know, having all things in common and sharing possessions, and, you know... No poor amongst them and those kind of things. But I'm seeing how difficult that would be. Oh, yeah, it'd be hard. <laughs> it sounds easy on paper. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I feel like I, there, there may not be any sense of trying to, uh, um, it, n- nothing's ever that easy. But then I think of Clarence Jordan. Are you familiar with, anyone familiar with Clarence Jordan? Created Koinonia, Greek word fellowship, where um, him, his, his wife Florence and another couple purchased 440 acres of land in Georgia to create what they call the kingdom plot, uh, where they're like, you know what, let's just do it. Let's just do it. We're going to create this, and we're going to share uh, uh, common goods, uh, uh, and we're going to make a life together. And, and this is in the 50s and 60s, so we're going to be racially diverse. Um, I mean, these people were firebombed. They were shot at. Their kids were called communist, uh, which is funny because it's kind of proof that Christians in Georgia in the 60s neither understood communism nor Christianity <laughs> on either case. Uh, uh, they kind of missed it. Uh, um, but it was such a front. What's funny about Koinonia is the land that they purchased, they found out that they couldn't really grow a lot of crops. The only thing they could, they could shell were, were pecans. And so they ended up, uh, nobody would buy uh, the pecans from them in Georgia because they were just this horrible group of people, you know. And um, so they had to sell their pecans out of state. And so their slogan was shipping the nuts out of Georgia. Um, <laughs> if you don't know about Koinonia, for those of you who don't, Koinonia became Habitat for Humanity. That was Clarence Jordan's project. And in a lot of ways, Clarence Jordan saw what he did as something of a failure. There were a lot, there were a lot of pe- not as many people joined the community as he hoped, you know, um, to, to pull all resources together. Um, but I would say you look at... I would say if there was an answer, you would look at um, folks like Koinonia and other intentional communities and see what they do. I was part of an intentional community in Evanston where the Mennonites there had, you know, two dozen houses that, um, and, and that families lived together uh, mentally and physically. Handicapped folks lived, uh, uh, folks, and, uh, and it was just all this sort of attempt at this kind of insular commonwealth mixed a very rich area, as a matter of fact, because I was at Northwestern Garrett, which is in Evanston, and um, that's what those Mennonites were doing. Oh. What, we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, sir. I wondered if uh, Mennonites uh, reverence St. Francis of Assisi, he's like an early Mennonite. <laughs> right, very much. Uh, I don't know if I do. I, I like St. Francis, because again, he was, he was a very odd duck. You know, um, yeah, he was out there preaching to wolves. And I actually, I wrote an article on him because Christopher Hitchens, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. Christopher Hitchens, yeah. really funny. I mean, he was hilarious. Uh, very, not a careful scholar. There's a reason why in, in, in some of his books he doesn't cite sources because he just sort of makes them up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's really bad, but he's so funny and witty. But anyhow, he, he's ripping on... on uh, the ridiculous nature of Christianity. And in particular, he's, he's poking fun at St. Francis. He's like, you know, how can anyone take seriously a, a, a tradition that turned a guy who preached to birds, because Jesus said to, uh, who preached to birds and wolves and actually expected them to repent and change their waves, how could anybody take seriously a tradition that makes that person a saint? And I'm like, exactly. Exactly. What an odd, crazy, weird tradition that we would make St. Francis a saint, you know, because and, and of course, in Catholicism, a saint is a saint only because that person shows you an interpretation of Jesus that is otherwise maybe unknown at that time. Francis helps us see Jesus um, in that particular time. And so uh, um, he's, you know, at the same time, a lot of old order Mennonites are distrustful of anything that that's, you know, starts to reek of icons. I mean, they're iconoclastic in that sense. Uh, um, but Francis is a good brother uh, in, in the sense that he practiced the very peculiar and strange way of Jesus. And so he'd be a, a friend for sure. I'm hopeful that the present quote is Yes, it gives a lot of hope there. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. One final uh, question. Uh, your latest book is called The, the Devil Wears Nada. What's mm. that about? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't, um, <laughs> I, how much time do I have? I, I try, oh, well, the, the reason I say that is because I don't know how to say what it's about without everybody going, oh my goodness, you know, without coming around to the end. Um, do what? Okay. It's my fe- facetious attempt to locate Satan in order to prove the, God's, the existence of God. But it's actually an attempt to point out how heretical the North American church is. And the whole thing is the whole project occurred over the southeast um, area of the United States where people deify uh, um, the devil uh, uh, in a way that I, it's not only problematic but almost humorous. And so I'm thinking that, and, and actually this was something of a response to Christopher Hitchens and, and, and the new atheist that I'm like, well, maybe they're right. Maybe it is difficult to prove the existence of God, so we'll go looking for Satan. But actually, the thing is, it's to try to point out how far, how different the church in North America's theological doctrines are from the historical church. Uh, And so it's really just sort of a foil to do that disguised as something else. And you can't get that until you get to the end kind of thing. You know, so people are reading by the second chapter and they're like, this kid's insane. Um, (laughs) Maybe, maybe. But when you get to the epilogue, you see it comes around. So buy the book. Even if you don't read it, buy it. Uh, (laughs) And buy all your friends a copy too. The devil wears nada. Thank you very much.